America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. For today's episode, we will be looking at The Conscience of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater. This book was published in 1960. Barry Goldwater was a senator from Arizona who ran for president and was considered the first major conservative presidential candidate, conservative as according to the sort of 20th century definition of conservatism. Um, that might be a stretch. I think there might be have been some other previous presidents who we could consider to be conservative, but there was a sort of conservative movement post-World War II um, that identified itself as uniquely conservative, called itself conservative, um, wasn't really just Republican or Democrat, but said, you know, we are conservatives and this is what we believe. And uh, Barry Goldwater was sort of the embodiment of that. He ran for president in 1964. He took a walloping, but uh, he was running against an incumbent, John F. Kennedy's vice president, uh, Johnson. And I don't think we can be super surprised that he lost that election. But he did sort of kick things off. Many people are many people consider him to be, you know, one of the one of the originators of conservatism. He wrote this book, The Conscience of a Conservative, very popular book uh, in its day, and it's 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 pretty good. But it definitely has the mark of its era. Um, it deals with certain particular aspects of governing certain aspects of political philosophy that were considered you know really important and and central to conservatism at that time um, it's not entirely a description of what we would consider conservatism today although many people today still really adhere to this as like the founding document of what conservatism is uh, but the fact is, it's it's dated. It's got a long chapter. The last chapter, I believe, is a long chapter, and it's about. It's called the Soviet Menace, and it's all about you know how to deal with the Soviet Union. This was at the height of the Cold War, and there were certain concerns that were important at the time this book was written. The global conflict against the Soviet Union, the Cold War, was the primary issue of this time, and. Uh, there was a certain manner in which conservatives, you know, responded to the Cold War and, and how we felt that our government should be was a reflection of the Cold War. Uh, it was a, a time when, okay, the communists were collectivists. So we tried to say, well, we're individualists. And the communists, you know, like communism and capitalism were sort of opposed. Communists were socialists. Well, okay, well, we're capitalists in opposition to communism. And the areas where we could kind of differentiate ourselves from communism became incredibly important. Uh, so capitalism at that time became an incredibly important part of conservatism in order to help distinguish us from communism. And, you know, we don't face the same circumstances today. And that's not to say that, like, those ideas weren't important, individualism, freedom, capitalism, and so on and so forth, that those ideas are no longer important, but we should recognize that they were put to the forefront for a very specific reason. And there's more to conservatism than just, you know, the promotion of capitalism. And, uh, and even, even capitalism, the promotion of capitalism, it was a certain way in which they went about it because it needed to be, it needed, they, we needed to send a message to the world that capitalism was the best. And so we needed to make sure that big businesses, you know, didn't fail, that they were successful. And um, there was a real like pro business approach and sort of some, you know, the kind of like crony capitalism sort of was born because I think there was a mentality that, you know, in, in order to win the Cold War, we need to make sure that these big businesses, big American businesses, maintain their profitability. They maintain, you know, employing lots of people, making lots of money for the investors. 
it's it was important as a PR campaign that these big businesses succeed. So I think there was a bit of crony capitalism as well in kind of trying to create an, uh, an image that could be contrasted with communism. So anyway, I'm going to read a few sections of this, as I always do. Uh, probably the most, what I consider to be the most important chapters are the first two. Chapter one, The Conscience of a Conservative. It's very short. I mean, it's like a, a eight, six, eight pages, six pages it is. Short, very short chapter. Chapter two is pretty short as well. Like I said, the last chapter, The Soviet Menace, is a, the longest chapter in the book. Uh, but I want to read some stuff from the first two chapters and a little bit uh, from other chapters. Not an awful lot from the other chapters, but I do want to mention. So basically he lays out his principles in the first two chapters and then the rest of the book is the application of those principles to a number of different uh, policy areas. So I'm going to jump in and re start reading right from the beginning of chapter one. I want to read just the first couple pages uh, so we can get a rough idea of his statement of what conservatism actually is. He says, quote, I have been much concerned that so many people today with conservative instincts feel compelled to apologize for them, or if not to apologize directly, to qualify their commitment in a way that amounts to breast beating. Republican candidates, Vice President Nixon has said, should be economic conservatives, but conservatives with a heart. President Eisenhower announced during his first term, I am conservative when it comes to economic problems, but liberal when it comes to human problems. Still other Republican leaders have insisted on calling themselves progressive conservatives. These formulations are tantamount to an admission that conservatism is a narrow, mechanistic, economic theory that may work very well as a bookkeeper's guide, but cannot be relied upon as a comprehensive political philosophy. The same judgment, though in the form of an attack rather than an admission, is advanced by the radical camp. We liberals, they say, are interested in people. Our concern is with human beings, while you conservatives are preoccupied with the preservation of economic privilege and status. Take them a step further and the liberals will turn the accusation into a class argument. It is the little people that concern us, not the malefactors of great wealth. Such statements, from friend and foe alike, do great injustice to the conservative point of view. Conservatism is not an economic theory, though it has economic implications. The shoe is precisely on the other foot. It is socialism that subordinates all other considerations to man's material well-being. It is conservatism that puts material things in their proper place, that has a structured view of the human being and of human society, in which economics plays only a subsidiary role. The root difference between the conservatives and the liberals of today is that conservatives take account of the whole man, while the liberals tend to look only at the material side of man's nature. The conservative believes that man is, in part, an economic and animal creature, but that he is also a spiritual creature, with spiritual needs and spiritual desires. What is more, these needs and desires reflect the superior side of man's nature, and thus take precedence over his economic wants. Conservatism, therefore, looks upon the enhancement of man's spiritual nature as the primary concern of political philosophy. Liberals, on the other hand, in the name of a concern for human beings, regard the satisfaction of economic wants as the dominant mission of society. They are, moreover, in a hurry, so that their characteristic approach is to harness the society's political and economic forces into a collective effort to compel progress. In this approach, I believe they fight against nature. Surely, the first obligation of a political thinker is to understand the nature of man. The conservative does not claim special powers of perception on this point, but he does claim a familiarity with the accumulated wisdom and experience of history, and he is not too proud to learn from the great minds of the past. The first thing he has learned about man is that each member of the species is a unique creature. Man's most sacred possession is his individual soul, which has an immortal side, but also a mortal one. The mortal side 
establishes his absolute differentness from every other human being. Only a philosophy that takes into account the essential differences between men and accordingly makes provision for developing the different potentialities of each man can claim to be in accord with nature. We have heard much in our time about the common man. It is a concept that pays little attention to the history of a nation that grew great under the initiative and ambition of uncommon men. The conservative knows that to regard man as part of an undifferentiated mass is to consign him to ultimate slavery." End quote. Okay, so uh, a couple of things I want to point out in there. Um, firstly, when he starts out, he talks about how so many people who with conservative instincts feel compelled to apologize for them. They kind of hedge. They say, oh, I'm a progressive conservative or I'm a conservative in this area. And you're going right back to Eisenhower with this. Conservative when it comes to economic problems, liberal when it comes to human problems. Um, kind of not really willing to just say, yes, I'm a conservative on all issues. And, you know, as he says, Nixon, he attributes to Nixon the quote uh, they, that Republican candidates should be economic conservatives, but conservatives with a heart, um, as if that was you know, not already inherent to conservatism. Uh, and that's pretty surprising because we have been getting that right up until the present moment where conservatives kind of like, oh, this is more like the mainstream elected officials tend to take this approach where they're not as vocal about and proud about it. I guess that's that's the rhino, right? Um which isn't to say that you know every single Republican has to be the hardest conservative they can possibly be. Uh, people have their own opinions and how they want to frame things, but um, there shouldn't be the sort of apologizing for conservatism. Uh, which is odd to say because you know I I'm not entirely certain that I want to identify myself as conservative. So I I I read this and I think on the one hand. You know, if you are conservative, if you believe yourself to be conservative, you should be proud of it and not just sort of hedging on the issue. Uh, but to claim a label like conservative or liberal or progressive or whatever it may be, nationalist, whatever your label may be, the minute you would attach a, a, a category to yourself, that comes with a whole bunch of other baggage, I guess, a bunch of ideas that you haven't necessarily created or communicated. Uh, and then all those other things come with it. So even the notion of, you know, saying I am this or I am that says a whole bunch of other things as well um, that you may or may not adhere to. Um, I think that, like, I mean, this is called the conscience of a conservative. Goldwater absolutely considers himself to be a conservative. But what's interesting is that you know, later on in his life, Goldwater um, advocated for a number of things that today people would say, you know, oh, that's that's not a conservative position. Goldwater was pro-choice. Uh, he was pro-gay marriage, and he advocated for certain things that, you know, nowadays, like being pro-life or pro-choice, many people view that as like the ultimate litmus test of whether or not you are or are not a conservative. So I think that probably, you know, toward the end of his life in the 80s and 90s, um, there were probably people that were like, oh, well, Barry Goldwater's not a real conservative. You know, Barry Goldwater's a rhino. He's not a real conservative, which is interesting because he, he was one of like the founders of what conservatism is. The meaning changes over time and different people are going to want to be like, this is, this is, or that is what conservative is in order to support their own positions, in order to position themselves as essentially like the ultimate conservative. So whatever my position is, that is what conservatism is. That positions me in the center of conservatism. So anyway, uh, what else did I want to note from here? Uh, he says that, you know, conservatism is not an economic theory, but it has economic implications. Uh, conservatism means a lot of different things. You know, if you look at like Russell Kirk's book, there's a whole array of dispositions and, um, you know, attitudes about civilization, attitudes about Western civilization specifically, about 
human nature. There's a lot of philosophical components to it. Um, and so, well, Goldwater says, you know, it's not really, it can't just be squared off as like an economic theory. But he does, as we'll see as we go, he does kind of lay out a, a simple core principle of conservatism and sticks to that fairly narrowly. And so he's even guilty himself a little bit of just sectioning off a section, an idea, a concept, and being like, now this, this is what conservatism is really all about. Uh, and he neglects a whole bunch of other things. Like he doesn't even mention uh, abortion in this book at all. And, and so many people today would think, you know, that's so important if you're going to write a book, The Conscience of a Conservative, to not talk about abortion or to not talk about religion. He barely talks about religion at all. He mentions in that section that I read, um, the immor the soul, the possession of, of a soul. But my, my point is that he doesn't really talk about religion in here at all. He doesn't make any sort of claim that a religious disposition is fundamental to conservatism which you get more of later, like in Mark Levin talked about it a little bit, um, and you get more of that uh, in later years. And in fact, towards the later years of his life, in the 80s and 90s, Goldwater spoke out against the religious right uh, having so much power within the Republican Party. He complained that they were turning the Republican Party into a religious organization. Uh, he wound up really actually opposed to quite a number of... Um, of Republican positions and Republican actors, he really became more and more, as he got older, uh, more and more of a libertarian. And so religion was never really a part of his agenda. He never considered that the Repu that conservatism was a religious disposition or had religious demands. Uh, I just, I think it's pretty interesting how as he got older, he, he really did like stand against a lot of things that people nowadays would say is fundamental to conservatism. So I guess it's just a mark of the way conservatism changes over the years, uh, what the priorities are of conservatism. And like I said, at the time that he wrote this, the priority really was the Cold War. And his argument is, is built in some way built in opposition to communism. It's built to set up conservatism as sort of diametrically opposed to communism. Uh, but I, I like the way he says, one thing he says here that is interesting is that um, he says man has an immortal side and also a mortal one. And it is the mortal side that establishes his differentness from every other human being. So only a philosophy that takes into account the essential differences between men, a.k.a. the mortal aspects. I mean, if the absolute differentness comes from our mortality and not our immortality, then the differences between us, uh, is a political philosophy that takes into account the essential differences, it makes provision for developing the different potentialities of each man can claim to be in accord with nature. Now, what he's looking for is a political philosophy that is in accord with nature. That is what makes the philosophy legitimate, it seems, in this statement. So he's looking for a philosophy that is in accord with nature and as such recognizes the differences between people and not just obsessed with their sameness. Now, other episodes of the show, I've talked about human nature and how people have a common, there's a common human nature that all people have. Clearly, though, that's not the beginning and the end of it, where we're all not just carbon copies of one another. Obviously, everybody has their own individuality, our own uh, way of behaving and our own way of looking at the world. But at the same time, we operate within certain constraints that, you know, on the whole, we have tendencies. And particularly when you speak of societies, you're, you're getting into the averages and the aggregates. And more clearly, societies have commonalities between them. People have commonalities. But 
people have differences between them as well from one to the next, and societies have differences between them as well from one to the next. All those things are all simultaneously true. Uh, but what he says about conservatism is that it, you know, it's taking into accord the differences between people. He says, we've heard so much in our time about the common man, but it's a concept that pays little attention to the history of a nation uh, that grew through the initiative and ambition of uncommon men. The conservative knows that to regard man as part of an undifferentiated mass is to consign him to ultimate slavery. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a statement against collectivism. It's a statement against viewing people as part of an undifferentiated mass, you know, the mass man, as we spoke of in previous episodes, just sort of the common man as such, uh, viewing people as a sea of, of, of uh, kind of nameless faces, that conservatism recognizes individuality, recognizes each person as dis a distinct, unique individual. Uh, so that's all that's all pretty good and interesting stuff there, but he does let's see let's move on from here That's all I wanted to read from uh, the first chapter uh, But chapter two is the perils of power and I think this is the chapter where he he lays out the principle That he follows through with for the rest of the book. He talks about federal the power of the federal government and accruing power in the hands of the federal government uh, is against the principles of conservatism. Conservatism wants to adhere to the Constitution, which demands a limited federal government. The Constitution lays out the limitations that are placed upon the federal government. And adherence to the Constitution, adherence to the principle of limited government is really what he lays out as the core of conservatism. So let me just go ahead and read the section here uh, from this chapter that I wanted to read where he says, quote, Throughout history, government has proved to be the chief instrument for thwarting man's liberty. Government represents power in the hands of some men to control and regulate the lives of other men. And power, as Lord Acton said, corrupts men. Absolute power, he added, corrupts absolutely. State power considered in the abstract, need not restrict freedom, but absolute state power always does. The legitimate functions of government are actually conducive to freedom. Maintaining internal order, keeping foreign foes at bay, administering justice, removing obstacles to the free interchange of goods. The exercise of these powers makes it possible for men to follow their chosen pursuits with maximum freedom. But note that the very instrument by which these desirable ends are achieved can be the instrument for achieving undesirable ends. That government can, instead of extending freedom, restrict freedom. And note, secondly, that the can quickly becomes will the moment the holders of government power are left to their own devices. This is because of the corrupting influence of power, the natural tendency of men who possess some power to take it unto themselves more power. The tendency leads eventually to the acquisition of all power, whether in the hands of one or many makes little difference to the freedom of those left on the outside. Such then is history's lesson. Release the holders of state power from any restraints other than those they wish to impose upon themselves, and you are swinging down the well-traveled road to absolutism. The framers of the Constitution had learned the lesson. They were not only students of history, but victims of it. They knew from vivid personal experience that freedom depends on effective restraints against the accumulation of power in a single authority. And that is what the Constitution is, a system of restraints against the natural tendency of government to expand in the direction of absolutism. We all know the main components of the system. The first is the limitation of the federal government's authority to specific delegated powers. The second, a corollary of the first, is the reservation to the states and the people of all power not delegated to the federal government. The third is a careful division of the federal government's power among three separate branches. The fourth is a prohibition against impetuous alteration of the system, namely Article V's tortuous but wise amendment procedures. Was it then a democracy the framers created? Hardly. The system of restraints on the face of it 
was directed not only against individual tyrants, but also against a tyranny of the masses. The framers were well aware of the danger posed by self-seeking demagogues, that they might persuade a majority of the people to confer on government vast powers in return for deceptive promises of economic gain. And so they forbade such a transfer of power, first by declaring, in effect, that certain activities are outside the natural and legitimate scope of public authority, and the second by dispersing public authority among several levels and branches of government in the hope that each seat of authority, jealous of its own prerogatives, would have a natural incentive to resist aggression by the others. But the framers were not visionaries. They knew that roles of government, however brilliantly calculated to cope with the imperfect nature of man, however carefully designed to avoid the pitfalls of power, would be no match for men who were determined to disregard them. In the last analysis, their system of government would prosper only if the governed were sufficiently determined that it should. What have you given us? A woman asked Ben Franklin toward the close of the Constitutional Convention. A republic, he said, if you can keep it. End quote. Okay, so here we get the principle. The chapter is called The Perils of Power, and he's talking about power in the federal government and how power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And he talks about how uh, the, there are legitimate functions of government which are conducive to freedom, but uh, too much uh, power in the hands of the government will work against freedom. He says that government essentially has a because of the corruptive nature of power, government has a tendency to just seek more and more power, and the framers of the Constitution sort of set up systems to prevent the federal government from, from grasping at more power, to sort of put a check on things. He says we are not, in fact, a democracy because not only does the federal government have you know, checks against tyrants, it also has checks against you know, unrestricted democracy whereby like 51% of the population could simply vote themselves the all of the resources of the other 49%, certain ways in which the masses themselves could, you know, be unjust or could violate the liberty of other people. And the Constitution is designed to prevent that as well. And so he's really a constitutionalist and he's really against um, aggregation of power in the federal government. He talks about the Tenth Amendment and how, you know, the power is restricted to the states. Uh, power that is not given to the federal government is restricted to the states. That, and he talks about how the Constitution is, is a document that limits the federal government. It outlines, you know, here are the things that the federal government can do and everything else that's not listed in this document belongs to the states, does not belong to the federal government. But he also talks about how uh, the Constitution depends on people, a people who want that Constitution to have power. I mean, ultimately, it's a piece of paper with scribbles on it. Um, law and the Constitution only have as much power as the people give it. Uh, if judges who, who are evaluating the constitutional the constitutionality of certain laws um, don't themselves adhere to the Constitution and, and apply the constitutional principles, then how much power does the Constitution really have? It depends upon people willing to enforce the Constitution. Um, and, you know, the, the Constitution itself is like the highest law. It's the highest level of law. And any law that's passed by the federal government that isn't in adherence with these constraints that are placed upon it is an unconstitutional law because the constitution says you know you can the government has these powers and no more and so if the federal government tries to pass a law that's usurping the power that according to the constitution belongs to the states um, and that law is unconstitutional and should be presumably found unconstitutional by the courts uh, so the rest of the book after this chapter is really the application of this principle of a limited federal government to a whole sort of whole set of different policy areas.
And I think that, you know, this comes back to the concept that that at that time, the greatest threat was international communism and the, and the principles of state power. And it, it was the, the concern about authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Um, you know, we, the Nazis were in fairly recent memory. The Soviet Union was an, a, an authoritarian state that was, you know, aggressive and was trying to spread its doctrine across the world. Um, there was a real concern at this time about authoritarianism. Um, unfortunately, that concern for authoritarianism, it just like sticks to us like glue. And no matter how, um, no matter how free society becomes, no matter how totally devoid we become of any sort of structure in our society, the more we just let everybody do anything they want, uh, and it's it's always it always remains this like looming threat of authoritarianism, even if authoritarianism is not in any way, shape, or form the real nature of the threat to our nation or the threat to Western civilization. Western civilization is not under threat by authoritarianism, not really. It's dissolving because it doesn't have any sense of propriety of what is and isn't um, you know appropriate action for. A civilization to to undertake, it doesn't have self-preservative quality to it. It's it's really on anything goes um, nature, which d has no will to enforce a culture, to have a culture that has you know boundaries of this is this is good, this is bad, this is taboo, this is what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Like the imposition of authority, even a, a sort of moral authority, is just. Um, people are just terrified of that whole concept because they're always on edge at author you know authoritarianism is right around the corner and uh, unfortunately we still carry that with us even if it's not necessarily appropriate but that's a, a tendency that we have and a, t a tendency that conservatives have to fight yesterday's battles and fight yesterday's wars and the you know the threat of global communism is not really around today although there are certainly people who will, will you know, advocate for communism. Um, it, it's, it's a different sort of communism. It's not the economic communism necessarily. It's, you know, uh, cultural Marxism or what have you. But too many conservatives, and especially older conservatives, they're just, they're still like reading from Barry Goldwater. And they're still like this, you know, the limited federal government, you know, is the number one objective that we need to be pursuing. Um, and while I, while I agree that limiting the, the size and scope of the federal government and giving more power to the states is certainly like a good principle to follow, um, that's not the real core of the challenges that we face today. That's not really where our problems are coming from. And I'll get into that a little bit in a later section. So let me jump forward here. Uh, this is actually another section from that chapter, The Perils of Power. The, the last part, the, the last couple paragraphs uh, I want to read where he says, quote, Our tendency to concentrate power in the hands of a few men deeply concerns me. We can be conquered by bombs or by subversion, but we can also be conquered by neglect, by ignoring our constitution and disregarding the principles of limited government. Our defenses against the accumulation of unlimited power in Washington are in poorer shape, I fear, than our defenses against the aggressive designs of Moscow. Like so many other nations before us, we may succumb through internal weakness rather than fall before a foreign foe. I am convinced that most Americans now want to reverse the trend. I think that concern for our vanishing freedoms is genuine. I think that the people's uneasiness in the stifling omnipresence of government has turned into something approaching alarm. But bemoaning the evil will not drive it back, and accusing fingers will not shrink government. The turn will come when we entrust the conduct of our affairs to men who understand that their first duty as public officials is to divest themselves of the power they have been given. It will come when Americans, in hundreds of communities throughout the nation, decide to put the man in office who is pledged to enforce the Constitution and restore the Republic. 
who will proclaim in a campaign speech, I have little interest in streamlining government or in making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. I do not undertake to promote welfare, for I propose to extend freedom. My aim is not to pass laws, but to repeal them. It is not to inaugurate new programs, but to cancel old ones that do violence to the Constitution, or that have failed in their purpose, or that impose on the people an unwarranted financial burden. I will not attempt to discover whether legislation is needed before I have first determined whether it is constitutionally permissible, and if I should later be attacked for neglecting my constituents' interests, I shall reply that I was informed their main interest is liberty, and that in that cause I am doing the very best I can." End quote. So he proposes that a couple things um, that, you know, he says bemoaning the evil will not drive it back and accusing fingers will not shrink government. That's certainly true um, of, of us today where complaining about the state of things is, is I mean, it's, it's not that it's totally useless. It's good to communicate with other people and kind of align what people are, are, are talking about or are concerned about convincing other people that we're correct. But um, complaining is, is, in the end, a pretty useless endeavor. Uh, it requires action to get things done, and I think that there are far too many people who look at the current status of, of our civilization and, and, and feel that complaining about it, complaining about the hypocrisy or complaining about uh, whatever it may be, is somehow going to affect the change, and the people who are driving the, the problems that we face don't care about your complaints. Uh, you have to actually stop them. Uh, but the other thing is that he says that the change comes when we entrust the conduct of our affairs to men who understand that their first duty as public officials is to divest themselves of the power they have been given. Um, and here we run into a bit of a problem because the real, um, the real problem that we face is not that Congress has too much power or even that the, that the president has too much power. It is that the administrative state has too much power. The bureaucracy, the federal bureaucracy, has too much power. It's entrenched. It can't be gotten rid of. People have, you know, uh, jobs that they can't be fired from. And the Congress has just handed all of its decision making and its enforcement abilities. It has handed everything over to the bureaucracy, to the administrative state to craft the regulations, enforce the regulations, and Congress has just sort of given up on doing its job of reining in the administrative state or, you know, being the, the decision makers as to what is and isn't law. We've decided that the bureaucracy can write the laws for us. And so it's not necessarily the case that what we want is, is people, elected officials, to go into Washington and say, you know, I, I hereby renounce the capacity to do anything. What we what we get is that we get the left gets into power and they advance their agenda. Uh, and their agenda is not just a, a bloated federal government. They have a social agenda. They have a cultural agenda. And they get into power and they advance that cultural agenda. And then people from the right get into power and they believe that their agenda is to uh, shrink the government. So maybe it shrinks a little bit. Let's say hypothetically, for example, let's say that the left gets in power and expands the federal government and the right gets in power and shrinks the federal government. And that's not really what happens, but let's imagine for a moment that it fluctuates back and forth between expansion and contraction. But every time that the left gets into power and expands, they use the power to push their cultural agenda. And so while the government might hypothetically take one step larger, one step smaller, one step larger, one step smaller. The culture, as influenced by the state, takes one step leftward, one step nowhere. One step leftward, one step nowhere. And so the culture continually moves leftward because whenever the, the left, whenever the Democrats have power, they push their cultural agenda and the right doesn't push its cultural agenda because it doesn't believe that it's appropriate for the government to push the cultural agenda like that. And so there's just this constant on and off, if you will, hammering of a leftward drift in culture. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a problem. And it may be the case that conservatives need to wield the power of government uh, in the face of an opponent that is wielding the power of government. Um, and, and secondarily, of course, is the fact that the, the federal government is not 
fluctuating between expanding and contracting. At the absolute best, it is fluctuating between expanding fast and expanding slow. Uh, that's not effective. And he says that what's really needs to happen is, you know, people need to go into office that are going to, you know, advance uh, the, the, you're going to push for the contraction of government. Many people hold up Reagan as like the manifestation of Goldwater's ideals, that Goldwater set the, you know, he started things in motion and then Reagan got into office where Goldwater couldn't. And Reagan was, you know, advancing Goldwater's ideas. But when we look at how things have unfolded, I mean, did Reagan really shrink the federal government? Not really. Not in any lasting way. The government, you know, if Goldwater thought the federal government was bloated, he'd, he'd, he'd be floored to look at it today. It doesn't uh, ever shrink. It just grows and grows endlessly. And we have to sort of say, well, you know, Goldwater's conservatism has completely failed to have any sort of an effect. If Let's say that if the ultimate goal of the conservatism of Barry Goldwater had at its, as its goal was the shrinking of the federal government, then there's no other conclusion one can draw but that the entire 20th century represents the failure of conservatism. So if that is the goal of conservatism is shrinking the federal government, and the government has expanded regularly through the entirety of the 20th century and continues to do so, I don't see how it can be seen as anything other than a failure. Now, I'm a chess player, and you know everybody knows you win some games and you lose some games. And even people like Magnus Carlsen, they lose games from time to time. Not really when it counts, but you know, like everybody loses sometimes, and you, you don't just rack up only victories. And so there's some forgiveness for, okay, you know, you guys didn't really get the victories that you were hoping for, you didn't achieve what you were hoping for. Um, and while forgiveness is okay, we can't forget, you know, we can't forget that like the form of conservatism that has been advocated, uh, that was advocated by Goldwater and has been advocated by the baby boomer generation um, and has been advocated by conservatives all through the 20th century uh, hasn't delivered the results. It has set its agenda as being, you know, primarily centered around the size of and scope of the federal government. That has been like the big thing, shrink the federal government. And if that was the number one objective, there's no, there's no way to describe it as anything other than, other than a failure. And especially when you consider that uh, for the left, the left didn't set its agenda to be the expansion of federal government. It's not like the right wanted to shrink it and the left wanted to expand it. The left's agenda was a social and cultural agenda of spreading a sort of uh, a, a deep criticism of Western civilization, a criticism of capitalism, a criticism of everything that we have done so far to get where we are, um, dissolving all traditional norms in society has been their agenda. And the expansion of the federal government has just been a tool that the left has used to achieve those ends. And so the left's, the, like the, the size of the federal government was really only a, 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 a tool or a footnote even of the agenda of the left. And yet they've achieved that with great success. Um, and so like I sometimes I just feel like, geez, the the catastrophic failure of conservatism over the past, let's say, 80 years has been so thorough um, that we cannot move forward as conservatives without acknowledging that something's got to change. We can't just keep the sort of principled loser mentality. Because, it, I mean, it serves a lot of conservatives well to be on the losing side. We can feel put upon. Oh, modernity is doing this. Everything is going in the wrong direction. We're the men among the ruins. You know, we're, we're standing here while, you know, shouting halt, athwart history shouting halt while, while history runs us over like a, like a freight train. And, and it's, it's, it feels normal for a conservative to be in the opposition 
right? That's what the opposition is. Watching, you know, the progressives are driving the train and the conservatives are standing by the side of the railroad with their hand in the air saying, slow down, stop. It doesn't serve the conservative mindset to be in power. Once conservatives are in power, they don't know what to do with that power um, because they're not built with a forward orientation. The conservative, the progressive is thinking forward. They're always thinking what's next, what's the future hold. And as soon as they get in power, they have plans. They know what they want to do because they have plans. But the conservative is always looking backward. So he's not building plans because he's not thinking about the future. He's thinking about the past. And he gets into power and he doesn't have the plans in hand. He doesn't have the vision in hand for what he's going to do other than shrink the federal government. And that's, I mean, the size of the federal government is pretty uninspiring for a vision for the future. Anyway, let me jump forward to the next section. He talks a little bit about civil rights. Um, I don't want to read a huge section of this, but I will read a little bit of it here. Uh, he, so before I read this, Barry Goldwater was a member of the NAACP. He, he voted in support of several civil rights uh, laws, but then the Civil Rights Law uh, of Civil Rights Act of 64, um, he was against it. And he was really torn about the issue because he supported equality. He supported uh, uh, desegregation. He was an advocate of desegregation. Um, and yet he found that the Civil Rights Act of 64 was ultimately unconstitutional. And so he, it, gave, it gave the federal government authorities that it really shouldn't constitutionally have. And so he voted against it. Um, and was troubled by the fact that he had to vote against it. I don't think he regretted voting against it, but it, he was torn on the issue um, because he was looking at what he felt was best for society and then looking also at, you know, what the Constitution itself allowed. And, you know, also was very concerned about the size of federal government. And so when he saw that the amount of expansion that this act entailed or the federal government, he had to vote against it. But he talks here about civil rights and kind of lays out some of the ideas that went into his opposition to that act. But I wanted to state that ahead of time to understand that um, he was not, uh, Goldwater was not like a racist, he was not a segregationist. Um, he just thought that there were certain bounds within which the federal government had to operate. So anyway, he says here the following. He says, quote, The state's rights are easy enough to define. The Tenth Amendment does it succinctly. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Civil rights should be no harder. In fact, however, thanks to extravagant and shameless misuse by people who ought to know better, it is one of the most badly understood concepts in modern political usage. Civil rights is frequently used synonymously with human rights or with natural rights. As often as not, it is simply a name for describing an activity that someone deems politically or socially desirable. A sociologist writes a paper proposing to abolish some inequity, or a politician makes a speech about it, and behold, a new civil right is born the Supreme Court has displayed the same creative powers. A civil right is a right that is asserted and is therefore protected by some valid law. It may be asserted by the common law or by local or federal statutes or by the Constitution, but unless a right is incorporated in the law, it is not a civil right and is not enforceable by the instruments of the civil law. There may be some rights natural, human, or otherwise, that should also be civil rights. But if we desire to give such rights the protection of the law, our recourse is to a legislature or to the amendment procedures of the Constitution. We must not look to politicians or sociologists or the courts to correct the deficiency. In the field of racial relations, there are some rights that are clearly protected by valid laws and are therefore civil rights. One of them is the right to vote. The 15th Amendment provides that no one shall be denied the franchise on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. 
similarly with certain legal privileges enforced by the 14th Amendment. The legislative history of that amendment makes it clear, I quote from the Civil Rights Act of 1866, with the, which the amendment was designed to legitimize, that people of all races shall be equally entitled to make and enforce contracts, to sue, be parties, and give evidence, to inherit, to purchase, lease, sell, hold, and convey real and personal property, and to full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of persons and property. After the passage of that act in the amendment, all persons, Negroes included, had a civil right to these protections. It is otherwise, let us note, with education. For the federal constitution does not require the states to maintain racially mixed schools. Despite the recent holding of the Supreme Court, I am firmly convinced not only that integrated schools are not required, but that the Constitution does not permit any interference whatsoever by the federal government in the field of education. It may be just or wise or expedient for Negro children to attend the same schools as white children, but they do not have a civil right to do so, which is protected by the federal government or which is enforceable by the federal government. The intentions of the Founding Fathers in this matter are beyond any doubt. No powers regarding education were given the federal government. Consequently, under the Tenth Amendment, jurisdiction over the entire field was reserved to the states." End quote. Uh, so essentially, he's saying that there's a difference between a civil right and a natural right or a human right, and you can assert that this or that thing is a human right, um, but it's not a civil right unless it's encoded in the law. And that means even if the federal government makes a law saying, um, you know, these people have to do this thing in accordance with this civil right, if the, if the federal government is acting in an area that to which it has no authority to act, then, though, then there can't be federal civil rights in that area because the federal government doesn't have the authority to make those laws unless it's codified specifically in the Constitution. And the educational issue, the issue with desegregation, is not it. The, those powers over education and, the, and the, the shape of our educational institutions is not given to the federal government by any of the amendments or any of the content of the Constitution. So the states can all set up their own civil rights laws as regarding education and integrated schools. But it's just not a domain that the federal government has any authority in unless an amendment to the Constitution is passed that gives the federal government that authority. And he argues that that authority isn't actually in the Constitution. It's not in the 14th Amendment. It's not in the 15th Amendment. It's not in the Constitution. Um, so whether or not integrated schools is good or bad is irrelevant to the question of whether or not it's constitutional. So uh, I thought I would bring that up. I don't want to get any further into that. He talks about labor. Um, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, he says a little bit more about education um, that I want to read from. And this will be the last section I read. This is pretty short. The last section I read from this book when he says the following. Quote, I agree with lobbyists for federal school aid that education is one of the great problems of our day. I am afraid, however, that their views in mind regarding the nature of the problem are very many miles apart. They tend to see the problem in quantitative terms. Not enough schools, not enough teachers, not enough equipment. I think it has to do with quality. How good are the schools we have? Their solution is to spend more money. Mine is to raise standards. Their recourse is to the federal government. Mine is to the local public school board, the private school, the individual citizen as far away from the federal government as one can possibly go. And I suspect that if we knew which of these two views on education will eventually prevail, we would know also whether Western civilization is due to survive or will pass away. To put this somewhat differently, I believe that our ability to cope with the great crises that lie ahead will be enhanced in direct ratio as we recapture the lost art of learning and will diminish in direct ratio as we give responsibility for training our children's minds to the federal bureaucracy." End quote. Okay, so not a super long section, but uh, he does uh, 
again, he brings it back to federal authority. So in the question of education, he says, you know, there's a lot of people that want to spend more money on schools, want to hire more teachers, want to throw money at the problem. More, 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 more is going to fix it. And he says, actually, the problem really has to do with quality. You can't just throw money at it. You can't hire more teachers. You can't build more schools. You have to concern yourself with the standards by which the schools are held to, by which the students are held to. What is the quality of the education? And he says that the issue will ultimately be resolved at the local school board level as far away from the federal government as possible. And what I want to point out, too, is the very last section. He says... Uh, our ability to cope with the great crises that lie ahead will be enhanced in direct ratio as we recapture the lost art of learning and will diminish in direct ratio as we give responsibility for training our children's minds to the federal bureaucracy. Now, this is something that I want to point out here is that, again, he's coming back to the federal government, how, you know, there's a direct relationship to how well we are going to be equipped to deal with the problems of the future based on how much involvement the federal government has. The more involvement the federal government has in our education system, the worse off our students will be, our future generations will be to deal with problems. And this, I think, is is, is a problem in itself, that the, the, the educational system today is pretty screwed up, and we're teaching kids pretty screwed up things. Um, the so-called woke uh, revolution in our schools, teaching kids to hate their civilization, anti-white, anti-male, anti-straight. Um, there's just a lot of crap in our school systems, and they get worse and worse, and the problem that we face is not actually have anything to do with how much involvement the federal government has. I mean, maybe there's some amount of influence of the Department of Education and federal funding and stuff, but the problems that our schools are facing are coming from the teachers, the principals, the superintendents, the school boards, and the state governments. That's where the corruption lies. That's where these ideas are destroying our schools. They're coming directly from the teachers, which is pretty sad because you can't, it's nice if you can just blame the federal government and you know say, well, if people left to their own devices, they could do it right. If the federal government would stop interfering. That's nice for a soundbite. It's nice um, to give you a nice good enemy that is the federal government and a good guy, which is like the local school board. But the local school board, in many of these cases, is the enemy. The teachers are the enemy. The, the corrupting ideas, the, the self-loathing of Western civilization that Western civilization has for itself, the, the, the desire to basically dismantle um, our own civilization comes from the teachers and the school boards and the administrators of the schools. And you could completely extract the federal government from the operation entirely and have virtually no impact on this corrosive, destructive ideology that is tearing apart our civilization that comes from the school system and comes ultimately from the universities. It is an ideological challenge that we face. It's people with terrible ideas who are doing everything they can to infuse those terrible ideas into the minds of future generations. And the what I feel is a, a, an excessive focus on shrinking the size of the federal government as if that was itself a civilizational agenda um, is part of the problem. Zeroing in on the size of the federal government. If we could just shrink the size of the federal government to be you know, small enough to drown it in a bathtub or whatever it may be, if we can shrink the size of the federal government, somehow everything is gonna work out okay. But it's not. The, the problems that we have are ideological problems. They are cultural problems. And they can't be boiled down to a question of whether the federal government is big or small. That's just, that's not enough. And it's been the laser-like focus while the quality of the schools, 
the content of the schools, the, the cultural agenda of the left has gone uncontested, while people on the right just obsess over the size of the federal government. And what's worse, obsess with no real tangible result. And that can't be seen as anything other than a deep failure. And that's all that I'm going to say about that. Um, I will catch you on the flip side. Thanks for listening.